So good morning, everyone. Welcome to a Brilliant Businesses podcast. My name is Nick Bryant, and I'm I'm very pleased to be joined today by Nigel Gossage from Experian Financial Services. Good morning, Nigel. Good morning, Nick. Thank you for inviting me. That's fine. How are, how are you? All right. Yeah, feeling pretty good today. Good, good. good. Thanks for coming on the podcast. So. Experian provide wealth management um, to to individuals and to businesses across London and the South East. Nigel's got a pretty cool story. Um, he's going to tell us his story, how he started and got into business, and then we're going to run into some other topics. So, But you started off as a runner, I believe. Tell us a <laughs> bit about that, how that came about. Um, yes, I was a pretty good uh, footballer, rugby player and, uh, and athlete and could only do the other sports because I ran fairly quickly and for fairly long periods yeah. um i competed um as a teenager and really felt that um uh, being in the top 10 in the uk that uh, i could make a profession out of this although at that stage um it was pre any money being paid right. um, and i went to university with a view to uh, um uh, having a university of london degree but yep. um also uh, training full time and um uh, things happened. Um, I competed against uh, uh, some of the luminaries of the time, Seb Coe and uh, wow. Steve Ovette. Um, but I could never make the transition from um, a really good um, top 10 UK athlete to top 10 UK athlete as a senior. Um, so felt that uh, I had to go into business. Find some work to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, which was which was tricky in yeah. 1981. Yes. Uh, and, uh, it was a tough time actually, 1981, wasn't it? It was a big big recession, I think, back then. It, it, yeah. was, it, was, it was tough. Mm. It was a three-day week. Mm. It was um, lots of situations where people people were struggling to find work but uh, and we had Margaret Thatcher who um, who who changed the course of history of course <laughs> yes she did didn't <laughs> she um, so, uh, so then you went into financial services. You studied that at university. How did the next part come about? Uh, the the next part was um, uh, I came out of university and got a graduate trainee job, as uh, a lot of my uh, group did. Uh, I worked for a company called Thomas Tilling, which were part of the um, uh, a group that um, did uh, electrical wholesale work, and I trained in Eastbourne in uh, Birmingham and in Leeds and uh, eventually uh, came out of the training and became a, um, uh, a, a administration manager for yeah. New Year now. Okay. Uh, following that, I, I had a pretty varied career which ended up in me uh, deciding that I was more of a salesman and, um, uh, and took on a role uh, working with some of the major corporations in the UK, uh, B&Q, um, uh, Tesco's, Asda's. Um, we, uh, essentially, I was taking them across to China and the Far East and introducing them to um, into factories to bring uh, product into the UK and yeah. doing the complete logistics for them. That give you a good grounding into business, really, I would have thought that. Yeah, it yeah. W what it did was it, it made you cutting edge in terms of price mm. pointing, mm. Um, but it also gave you um, a full intro into the financial aspects because uh, the corporations generally uh, stayed with you for uh, four to five years as you found the, uh, the the factories in the Far East, Yeah, um, and they wanted you to bring it in for the insurance that you provided to them. Mm. Um, finally, um, the the market changed and the environment changed for uh, uh, for those companies, and they went uh, direct. And and having worked in um, the logistics and the financial side for the the last uh, twenty years, um, I talked with my accountant about uh, moving across and uh, to providing direct financial support to people. Yeah, and. Um, uh, he said that uh, no, I wasn't too old in my mid forties, and uh, uh, and so I I took the exams uh, on my own and uh, and passed all of the exams, yeah. and then uh, then joined the uh, the financial advice world. Right. And, uh, mm. uh, it was um, uh, it was at the millennia, so we were a bit worried about whether um, we'd be existing on <laughs> two thousand and one. All the computers were going to stop, <laughs> weren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, but then we we, we got going and yeah. um, went through the the first crisis in two thousand and eight, and that actually was um, 
was a great time for me because uh, I was expanding the business and uh, the rest of the financial world seemed to be hiding from their clients. And yeah. uh, uh, so they welcomed me turning up and uh, and making sure that we were looking after their long-term interests. So yeah. uh, I saw um, really good growth during 2008 and onwards, um, mainly because that was um, uh, my... Um, a raison d'etre, if you like, is that I wanted to uh, be able to support people um, on the downturn as well as on the upturn because yeah. um, there are ways and means of making sure that people can save for the long term. Yeah. And um, so Experium are members of St. James's Place. They're a St. James's Place partner. Is that correct? Uh, we're a partner of St. James's Place. Yes. I, I started uh, life in the independent world mm. and uh, was directly authorized by the FSA, as it was at those times. But now it's called the FCA after changes in the market. Mm. Um, but after the retail, um, the RDR retail review in 2015, um, the the marketplace changed somewhat for independent financial advice, and I found that um, I was regularly spending up to twenty hours on a weekend um, revising people's um, uh, portfolios, and um, uh, it was um, it was hard um, endeavour yeah. um, with uh, with no reward. Yeah, and I found that um, by moving. Um, St. James's Place had been uh, looking to recruit me as a partner from 2010 onwards. And finally, uh, in 2016, um, the, uh, the offer from St. James's Place um, had both um, high risk, medium risk, but it also contained low risk portfolios. And essentially, my cohort of clients were um, essentially low risk to medium risk. Mm. And at that point, it then became uh, sensible to move to St. James's Place because they did all of the research for the fund managers and uh, for the portfolios that I was employed with, which was immediately going to give me m 20 more hours to spend on clients yeah which is probably what you enjoyed more <laughs> yeah speaking <laughs> to clients yeah. is is really what it's about yes. um, understanding what their goals are and and uh, looking to achieve those goals mm. um, really important with st james's place to um, to have the right funds and mm. have the right fund managers in place um, but my role is to make sure that my clients are safe mm. and that uh, we're looking forward to how we achieve their goals. So um, a good combination and uh, um, we've really um, grown uh, substantially with St. James's Place because we've, um, we've got the security of a FTSE 100 company yes. providing us with a level of security mm. but also guaranteeing our advice which is... Uh, 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 a number one in the uh, in the marketplace. Yeah, it's good to have that as a as a, as a behind you, isn't it? As a back, not a backup, but it's good to have that support, isn't it? Really, I guess. There, and they, I mean, I have my pension with St James's Place, and um, as you know, and uh, the 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 service they offer and the, the communication is really good. I think as as a client from that side of things. Yeah, I think uh, one of the th the good things that we're doing now is that uh, we're transitioning people away from so much paper arriving through their door. Yes. So, uh, uh, so one of the the, the things that we have uh, focused on is making sure that um, uh, a lot of our clients uh, receive online. Mm. Now, with um, some of my elderly clients, they still want to receive by paper. Yeah. And so we still do our newsletters monthly um, uh, by, d by paper to them. Uh, but the bulk of, um, of my clients now accept by, um, uh, by the internet. Yeah. Now, your daughter, Rhiannon, works in the business with you, um, which is good, isn't it? <laughs> I, it, it, it's it, great. It, it's uh, fantastic. Yeah. It was exciting to begin with when we first got to uh, to work together uh, once she'd left university. Um, but Rhiannon goes right the way back to um, when she was 15 and used to uh, 
uh, come into the offices and chase all the insurance and pension companies yeah. uh, for me and my colleagues. And um, and they all uh, used to employ her during every holiday right the way through um, university. And when she um, uh, she got her 2-1 at, uh, at Cardiff, um, I told her in her final year uh, the market was pretty tough out there. And yeah. I said, look, come and work for with me uh, for a while and um, and then look to get a, a role um, exciting stuff it, it can be difficult working with mm. your uh, with family but it's actually been been brilliant during uh, the first period that after she left university Rhiannon took some of the um, uh, statutory exams within the profession and um, uh, put her details on LinkedIn and the day that she'd passed her mortgage exams, uh, within three hours, she had the top two players in the industry uh, invite her for uh, uh, to go and have interview. Wow! Um, it shows. I mean, you know, Rhiannon was unusual uh, in that uh, she was very well qualified with uh, with her A levels, uh, uh, GCSEs, and with her two one and getting um, quality marks at the mortgage was great. Mm -hmm. um, she was quickly snapped up uh, by uh, first one of the, um, uh, the, the uh, major players, and then she moved to another major player uh, within uh, three years. And uh, she was always um, looking to grow business directly with those clients. Um, but after that period with... Uh, shall I say, larger corporations with different requirements in terms of compliance, mm. um, then Rhiannon was um, was looking for a different challenge. Mm. And uh, it had always been my hope that she would come back as an equal with me. Yeah. And uh, St. James's Place offered us the opportunity of Rhiannon coming in and taking up a, an academy role uh, it also helped because she was able to um, uh, overhaul my administration and th it meant that uh, both I was more productive but also that Rhiannon really understood the nuts and bolts of working with St. James's Place mm. and of building our business together. Mm. Um, we, uh, in uh, 2017, we were really looking at... Um, uh, Rhiannon having a five-year period in which she would look to move to being the principal of the operation. And um, even with the uh, the background that we've had then um, over the last couple of years, then that still seems on track. Okay. Um, there's no doubt that she's always telling me what to do <laughs> anyway. But, uh, uh, but at the moment... Um, we're uh, we're transitioning to a limited company, and um, and that seems to be on track. Mm. Um, there's no intention of me going anywhere, but no. it's um, it, it, there are um, uh, distinct groups of people who um, some um, uh, I I appeal to because I'm older and I have less hair, <laughs> and apparently that offers gravitas. <laughs> I'm not sure about <laughs> that. Um, whereas the younger group. Mm. Um, uh, are attracted to uh, to Rhiannon, mm. and uh, she does p particularly well with uh, solicitors and uh, a, a pretty large corporations where she's been running financial well-being courses and yeah. uh, has been attracting some some good attention in yeah. that area. I think from a client's point of view as well, it's it's comforting to know they're dealing with a family business um, yes. rather than rather than you know it's people in an office kind of thing. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think it, it, it's helpful. Uh, I think it's also um, something that I hadn't really um, uh, considered before. But I've had a couple of people say, "Well, look, you're not going to go on forever, Nigel. What, you know, when I retire, <laughs> no one lasts forever. Yeah, yeah. What's going to happen?" And I said, "Well, you know, that's that's why we mm. are in a family business. It mm. means that there is uninterrupted um, advice, and the advice goes back as long as we've been working together." Yeah. So moving on to um, the the things that you offer and how you can help people. I mean, pension is a big part of it, isn't it? 
Um, so how can you help people with, with pensions? T- 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 talk us through that. Well, pensions are um, a, a really dirty word in the industry about mm. 20 years ago. Mm. Um, and um, thankfully, there have been a number of changes that were brought in by um, uh, Osborne in, uh, in, in the mid um, Fifteens, I think, but uh, uh, what he did, he gave pension freedoms, and historically, you would have worked till sixty-five, and then built up a pot of money, and that pot of money was put into what's called an annuity. Yeah. Well, of course, that uh, was great when annuities were um, were giving you a great return, uh, and for all of us out there who don't um, uh, know what an annuity means. Essentially, if you had a hundred thousand as a man at sixty-five in two thousand and four, then you could um, have a an annuity, which is a pension for life of fifteen thousand pounds. Okay. Now, fifteen thousand pounds means that um, uh, your hundred thousand is effectively covered by seven years' worth of payments. Yeah. And if you're going to live till 90, then you're substantially better off. Of course, today, um, we're looking at um, that same 100,000 with that 65-year-old, effectively giving you somewhere around £3,000 per year. And that means you've got to live 33 years to get your money back. Yeah. Now, realising that, there have been a number of changes within the industry, uh, but the principal one is the fact that you can take your tax-free cash and you can actually go into what's called drawdown. So we look at pensions, um, we look at annuities on an annual basis because there is a place, especially if someone is particularly ill, um, And but we don't look necessarily to take the money at 65 we may transition somebody back to 75 before they um, need to or want to take an annuity. Okay. And it means that it's much more flexible. Also, it's much more important to continue to make your money work for you. Yeah. And that's where we come in because it's about ensuring that um, we uh, maintain the growth on your pensions. and We don't look... Um, as a lot of pension companies do, we don't look to move away from um, uh, investing in equities, but um, a number look at moving into cash. Yeah. And so they automatically move you out in a system called lifestyling. Yeah. And lifestyling is great if you're looking to buy an annuity, but it's not so good if you're moving to cash when cash is not giving you a great return. So um, there are so many different options at Mm. age 65, which um, we need to explain just simply because um, there is little education out there on it and and the number of different ways in which we can help support and the government can support means that we can really transform somebody from 10 years before they retire. Yeah, okay. Um, and other investment proposals that you that you offer, the different ones that you offer. Yeah, the, one of the the great things about um, St James's Place as a FTSE 100 company is that they're able to put together a package of offers. So we've got um, uh, offers within the um, within trusts, within lifestyling, within um, looking at. Um, uh, the uh, inheritance tax position yeah, and uh, looking to really make sure that we're ensuring that this voluntary 40% tax, um, that we minimise your position and we look at how we can work with families. So we're a family operation and that uh, allows us to talk directly to people and we're able to talk um, about how the fam- family dynamics can work. Yeah, um, we've worked it within our own, and we've got the offerings to enable us to do that um, in that tricky area of uh, deciding how we transition and how we cover care costs. Uh, but we do work with traditional ISAs, unit trusts, yeah. 
and the the opportunities for looking at people's risk ratings and risk levels and we're very um, uh, concerned about making sure that we work within those areas that we um, enable people to take the risk that they feel comfortable with yeah yeah it's important isn't it? yeah well one of the things that we look at as as a company is uh, a system that is seven circles and that is um, what I would say is one of our um, uh, USPs we ensure that we look at the uh, holistically at every area of somebody's finances when they first talk to us and we look at all of their relationships yeah so that we make sure that we're making sensible decisions for them for their family life uh, in terms of um, the seven circles uh, we look at the the first area which is income and expenditure yep a great place to start and mm. something that um, most of my clients haven't ever budgeted <laughs> and Crazy. It, it it seems especially with the way in which the energy market is currently going yeah then I'm finding that uh, my talks about budgeting are uh, are, are resonating now mm. and uh, and we're getting people coming back to us for our income and expenditure uh, budget planners mm. um, but uh, i've uh, I've had clients who have had um, enormous um, income we're talking you know seven and a half thousand to ten thousand um, but still being in overdraft every single month mm. And the reason that they're in overdraft is because they don't budget mm. and because they have money in their account. Mm. Um, as soon as you set targets for people, then people respond. Right. Um, but if they have never thought of targets, but they've only looked at the fact that you know, oh, there's 2,000 in the in the bank, we'll, um, we'll, we'll spend the weekend away from the family and we'll... Um, uh, we'll go to Norfolk for the weekend, yeah. or we'll go to Wales for the weekend, yeah. which is great. But if you have a target for what you want to achieve in retirement, then just by challenging people to look at what they're spending and how they're spending, then that enables them to uh, to make the right decisions. Because ultimately, everyone makes their own decisions. Yeah. We just assist them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think that's that, that's something that a nice thing that you offer. So people can come into you, make an appointment, and you can sit down with them and you can go through that sort of stuff and educate them and help them on on that best approach. Um, and that's that's really a goal for you, isn't it? To get more people in there to educate them on how they can make their money work better. Yeah, it's about making sure their money works harder. Yeah. So that they they know that they're on the right track. Yeah. Um, one of the key things that we do though is that. Um, a, a client will talk to me and say, look, I, I've got 100000 that I want to invest. I've just inherited it. Yep. And I've got 100000 I want to put that into um, into an ISA in unit trust, and I want to make money from it. Well, that's great. Um, we, we have our initial meeting, and we, we talk about um, the seven circles. Yeah. Um, but part of the seven circles and the, the, the key for us is the emergency fund. Right. Um, and most people underestimate what they want in terms of emergency fund. Yeah. Uh, and we separated it into really three parts. The first part is um, uh, effectively, if they're working age, then we look at three times monthly income. Okay. So we that's pretty pretty standard. Um, but then the second part is unusual for um, for people in the industry. We um, look at um, they're woody woofy. And <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it has that reaction. Yes. And it is. The, what's that thing I've got you? Yeah. <laughs> and it's what do you want for yourselves? Excellent. Right. And um, we look at that over the next couple of years because most people forget that. And if you're looking to change the bathroom, yeah. or if you're looking to have a new car, or if you're looking uh, to have four holidays now that we're out of the pandemic, um, then we put the cost of that into what their emergency fund is. Now, a lot of people look at me and think that I'm crazy on this, but um, the truth is that um, if you are 
putting money into an investment and then have to take it out to pay for a, a car, uh, then uh, you are dependent upon what happens in the investment market. And you've seen over the last six months how things change in investment markets. Yeah. <coughs> and so what we've always advocated is that we set aside your woody woofy, uh, whatever that amounts to, yeah. uh, but we also add a 20% emergency, well, what if what have we forgotten? Yeah, yeah. what if, yeah. Is w- what if the boiler goes? Mm. What if um, the car breaks down? You know, so what if there's an emergency and you, you have to help somebody in the family? And so we add 20%. So it is not uncommon for people to uh, require emergency funds of um, well in excess of fifty thousand pounds. Right, and if that's the case, we we often look at um, NSI products and you know cash equivalents so that you um, you can be um, in invested in premium bonds or, um, or, or or small returns. Yeah. But it means that when people want to buy that particular object or go on that holiday, they don't have to sell when the market is down mm. because they're not invested in the market. Okay. And that's really important to Rhiannon and I. It's really our uh, foundation stone that yeah. we want to look and plan for the long term but make sure that the immediate future is covered and the the essential things that people are looking for are covered. Yes, excellent. You and I do um, some networking together, don't we? We do a BNI, and um, Nigel often talks about the seven circles and the Woody Woofy, uh, and it's a really interesting approach. And um, I, I, I'm, you know, I endorse that. I think it's a really good approach. And so, if you want your money to to work harder, then um, speak to Nigel. Um, all Nigel's details are on the the Brilliant Businesses website. Um, you can you can get him via the web his website, but you can all the details will be underneath this podcast. So, thank you, Nigel. Thank you for coming on today for the podcast. It's no, thank you for inviting me, and I've I've really enjoyed talking Good. Uh, about uh, what we do. Yeah, thank you, and we'll see you again for another podcast soon. Thanks very much. Thank you.